Hello, everyone, and welcome to fellowseminar.org. The current theme is birth death identifiability, again, and this is the first talk in a series of three talks on that topic. Please use the YouTube live comment box to ask questions. Today's speaker is Dr. Jonathan Terhorst. Jonathan is an assistant professor in the statistics department at the University of Michigan. He received his PhD from UC Berkeley in 2017 under the supervision of Professor Yun Song. His lab developed probabilistic models and statistical methods for studying evolution with specific applications to demographic <laughs> inference, detecting natural selection, and recently genetic epidemiology and phylogenetics. Dr. Terhorst and his group strive to develop new scalable inference methods backed by high quality software implementations that can be used by other scientists and also to understand these methods theoretically where possible. Welcome, Jonathan, and thank you for participating. Thank you. Thanks for the nice introduction. <clears throat> I'm very uh, honored to be invited and excited to tell you about this work. Uh, so this is joint work with a uh, former postdoc in our department, Brandon Legrid, who's now moved on to Georgia Tech. Um, and the work is going to be about identifiability and inference of phylogenetic birth death models. Uh, so the last time I gave this talk was to a math department, so I had a slide, slide what is a phylogenetic tree? Uh, obviously not necessary for this seminar. I promise there will only be one of these, but just so we're all on the same page, we're thinking about phylogenies. In this talk, we'll assume that they're uh, basically ultrametric, so we have uh, data that were all sampled at the present at time zero. Um, and maybe slightly differently from classical phylogenetics, I'm, interested in more phylodynamic type of questions. So I'm not necessarily interested in estimating the tree. I'm interested in estimating some parameters that govern the distribution of this tree. So we're going to view this tree as a random object. And we're going to try to infer some things about the evolutionary processes that generated it. Um, and so a sort of foundational paper in this area is this paper by uh, Helen Wellen et al. and PNAS. So they were using what's called a phylogenetic birth death process, which I'll describe soon. Uh, to infer the just the number of species going back in time for cetaceans in this case. Um, and importantly, that's slightly non-trivial, right? Because we don't see all the species that died, right? So we only see what, we, what was alive. And so the tree is in some sense bigger and more richer than the object that we could actually infer from data. And so that's sort of the overarching theme of this talk is you have this, this sort of um, phenomenon of, of ascertainment or bias that, that needs to be corrected for or thought about, and that leads to some very interesting mathematical and statistical questions. So th this is uh, one use of these methods. The other one that maybe you've seen more recently would be uh, uh, related to, say, COVID. Um, so we can think also of phylogenetic trees as representing infection. So this is what's called an infection tree. And so here the, the samples are going to be sampled viral genomes, like if you go to the clinic and um, get get your uh, blood draw and they sequence it and they find that you have COVID, then um, nowadays they're submitting all of these COVID sequences to this huge global database, jasad.org, which you may have heard of. And so that, that data can be used to reconstruct this sort of infection tree, which tells us something about the dynamics of, of the pandemic. And so in this infection tree, we've got sort of uh, leaves are representing samples, uh, these kind of bluish dots. There are mutations happening and then there are transmission events, which is when somebody gives COVID to someone else, and those are represented here by these red dots. Okay, so this is um, a huge phylogeny nowadays. The last I checked, Zod had like 14 million plus sequences, so we're looking at a, a, a phylogeny with 14 million leaves. It's enormous, um, and it's very, again, very rich, and there's a lot of information embedded in it, and people are using it um, to, to interrogate uh, COVID, so to infer the dynamics of COVID, for example, of the pandemic. Um, oh, by the way, I'm really happy to stop for questions at any point. Just uh, jump in and, and Eric will let me know. Um, so interesting questions we can ask about phylogenies in this perspective are basic ones like when did things diverge? So that's sort of a classic phylogenetic question. And then on the other kind of more macroevolution side, maybe we're interested in the, the rates of speciation and extinction going back in time. Um, so I, I imagine that species, like this tree is generated, it represents a speciation process, and I want to infer the rate at which new species were formed and disappeared going back in time. And as we'll see, this is a, this is a, a tricky question to answer. Um, and more recently, um, starting in about maybe 2010-ish with work of Stadler and others, uh, we can reparameterize this macroevolutionary model to also think about epidemiology. So we can 
um, actually reparameterize it to, to, to the classical SIR, susceptible infected recovered model in epidemiology. And so that lets us use basically the same methods to estimate things like the effective reproduction number, which you probably have heard of, this is this thing R. And so uh, R is the number that for a, in a very simple SIR model, if it's above one, then the pandemic is not gonna die out. And if it's below one, then it will eventually die out. Um, and this is currently being done for COVID. So we've worked on this and uh, I won't talk much about this work today, but we've got a method recently that's designed it, that, to use this huge phylogeny that I showed you in the last slide in order to infer R for, for COVID. And so this is a recent paper out of our group. And we're looking here at the uh, estimating R both kind of across the whole data set and also breaking it out by strains. And you can see there's this sort of interesting dynamics where strains seem to be displacing each other. So this is alpha variant and then Omicron came along and then, uh, sorry, Delta and then Omicron. And so, so anyways, the point is you can see that there's sort of interesting uh, phylodynamic and epidemiological uh, features embedded, signal embedded in this tree. And so the goal methodologically is to figure out how to, how to estimate those. So the basic tool in this, this uh, discipline, subdiscipline is uh, what's called a birth death process. So let me quickly outline for you what that means. Uh, let me say first and foremost that in this talk, I'm going to assume that we actually just directly observe the, the phylogenetic tree. So estimating the tree, which is a very hard and tricky problem that many people are working on. I'm gonna completely sidestep that and just assume we're given the real tree. And we'll see why this assumption, sort of how this colors our results at the end. But for now, we're going to assume we get observed the tree, and my goal is to infer some things about the tree, namely these, what I'm calling rate, rates of birth and death. So this sort of foundational stochastic process that, um, up, upon which these methods are built is the, the birth-death process, which I think goes back to this uh, classic paper by Kendall in the 1940s, I think. He had a couple papers in the 40s on this, uh, maybe earlier too. So. The basic idea is you have a, this is not a phylogenetic model, it's a simple stochastic process describing the growth of a population and it's pretty easy to understand. So essentially I have these two functions, lambda of t and mu of t. So these are gonna be non-negative uh, time functions that give you just the per capita rates of birth and death over time. And so if there are n sub t members at time t, then the rate at which the population increases by one is simply uh, n sub t times lambda t. And similarly, the population dies at rate n sub t mu t. And then with you know, one minus the probability of that, nothing happens. So this is a classical birth death process. Now this can be used as a sort of uh, actually a prior on phylogenetic trees. So the idea here is, and you get something called a, a phylogenetic birth death process. So the idea here is to, to view the surviving lineages of a tree as members of a population, and they're going to go extinct, they're going to be born, they're going to give birth, that is uh, bifurcate or go extinct, uh, which is to say terminate at a leaf um, at particular rates. So let me give you a sort of visual illustration of how this works. So we start sort of at some time tau naught, which is the origin, T0, and we sort of run this process forwards in time. Um, and as I said, the process sort of bifurcates at rate lambda. Um, and then at some, also the other sort of phenomenon in this process is death. So death occurs at rate mu and death for us means that one of the lineages in this case, T1 sort of terminates into a, into a terminal node or into a leaf. Okay. So we sort of continue this process forward and we see it gave birth a couple more times and then um, T3 died. And then we continue this all the way. And so what we get out is something that looks like a, like a phylogeny. It's not ultimetric yet, um, but then what happens is we come along at the present and we're gonna sample some data. In this case, I'll assume we actually got lucky maybe and just sampled all the leaves of the tree. Okay, so all the leaves of the tree that are actually extant or surviving to time zero are T2, T4, T6, T7, and T8. And so because I'm able to estimate the phylogeny perfectly, I, I basically see the sort of phylogeny of these five lineages that's embedded in the overall tree structure. But the important point is that there are some lineages in this tree, the, the quote unquote true tree that from which the tree, the, the, the generative process of the data that were not actually present in my sample. 
right? So I don't see parts of the tree. Okay. And that's important because if you think about, if we want to infer sort of the rates of death or birth or what I'm going to call speciation and extinction, then they look quite different if I, depending on which tree I'm given, right? So the tree that I actually had, like the true underlying tree, which is this one on the left here, you might con conclude that it had relatively high rates of speciation and extinction. Um, because you can see, you know, there's a fair number of birth events and also there's like three death events here, right? Um, but the tree I actually observed, the one that I would reconstruct from data if I just only collected data at the present and could do that perfectly, well, that has no extinctions, right? No, there's actually no, no extinct lineages. And that's, that's tautologically true, right? Because I don't see things that went extinct by definition if I'm looking at the present. Okay, so this one, and it also has fewer birth events as well, right? Like we don't observe birth of the lineage that led to T1 or that of T3 or T5. So if we were to naively infer these rates, which are again, touching on interesting evolutionary questions, then I would have a pretty biased view if I looked at a tree, if I only looked at this tree. So I need somehow to correct for this phenomenon of, of this sampling bias. And that's sort of the point of the phylogenetic birth death process is it takes into account these particular phenomena, these birth and death functions and gives us a likelihood for this tree sort of integrating over all the possible things that could have actually happened in the real tree. Okay, so the just to be precise, the likelihood of a real tree is uh, is pretty easy to write down, right? The completely observed tree, in other words, the one that was on the left-hand side of the slide I just showed you, that's really just a kind of a, it's basically a point process likelihood, right? So I go some length of time and then there's some rate at which events occur. There's like basically the sum of the birth and death rates and don't stare too hard at this notation. I'm just kind of making the point that the, the actual likelihood of this a completely observed tree is pretty easy to, to figure out. Um, however, the likelihood of the partially observed tree, the one we actually see from data, is, uh, is much less obvious. And that was um, um, figured out about 30 years ago and then with some follow-up work in the last decade. And so here you have to be careful to think again about this phenomenon of extinction and how that sort of affects your estimates or affects the overall distribution of the tree. So it's not crucial for this talk that you understand what sort of this equation, but just know that, that this was a kind of an open, uh, this was a research question that got figured out some time ago. And this sort of enabled us to start estimating these key quantities, lambda and mu from phylogenetic data. Okay. Be happy to pause for questions if there are any. No questions so far. It is really wonderful and clear. Thanks. Great. Okay, so, um, so, so the for, in particular, this this likelihood function has this function psi, which is it's fairly complicated. I mean, it's not you know it's the papers are clear enough, but it's it's not not an obvious thing to figure out. And and it renders the overall form of this likelihood fairly complicated. Um, and so one personal bit of speculation is so there turns out to be an identifiability issue with this model, which is the subject of this talk. And I kind of suspect that maybe one reason we didn't see it for so long is that this this function is kind of hard to stare at and understand. Um, so very recently, um, a, a nice idea came along, and that's of sort of looking at this tree in a slightly different way. So this is the, the trees from two or three slides ago. And again, we've got the one we observed over here on the right, and then the one that sort of actually happened over on the left. So the, the, the nice kind of clarifying way to view this process is that well, this tree had a birth rate lambda, right? Which we know has got to be higher than the one I actually would infer from the observed tree, because again, there are birth events that I'm just simply not going to see. This one on the right looks like an ultrametric tree that I generated from a pure, dearth, pure birth process, excuse me, so no death, uh, where the birth rate has to be necessarily a bit lower. In other words, it has to be pulled downwards, okay? So we're gonna start thinking about this concept called the pulled speciation rate or the pulled birth rate, lambda P. And that number is gonna be related to this birth rate lambda. So both of these, by the way, can be functions that vary over time, but the point is that lambda P necessarily has to be a bit smaller uh, in order to think about, uh, in order to correct for this phenomenon that I've, I've shown you. And the key insight, which is not mine, it's due to Luca and Pinnell, is that inference in terms of lambda P is actually a lot simpler. That, in particular, the likelihood function is much easier to look at and understand. Basically, I'm just going to model the observed data as being generated by a pure birth process, 
no deaths with some rate that's artificially lowered. And by making the correct definition, they say that like in math, lots of good results are due to nice definitions. So this is a nice definition, I think. So they define the pulled speciation rate as this basically the original speciation rate lambda times some correction factor, E of T, where E is the probability that a lineage that's alive at T is not observed at the present. So in other words, one minus that is the probability that this lineage, which is alive at T and gave birth, actually had descendants at the present. Right? So that is the exact thing that I need to correct for in order to, to sort of um, make this model correct on the basis of the observed tree. And the cool thing is that once you define this, the likelihood of a, of a tree becomes actually much simpler to write down. It looks almost exactly like a point process likelihood, if you know what that is. Basically, this is the accumulated rate at which births occur, this integral. So I go that amount of an exponentially distributed amount of time, and then the actual instantaneous rate is lambda p. So this, if you understand point processes or coalescent processes, this, this likelihood is immediately recognizable. And again, speculation on my part, I think that's part of what led Luca and Pinel to come up with this very nice paper. Because let's see, can, I just, this, can I just, uh, just yeah, interrupt? Yeah. I, I mean, that result, that the pulled result, the fact that you can like have things, you can take a birth death model and turn it into an inhomogeneous pure birth yeah. model, that goes way back, right? That's, uh, oh, does it? This, doesn't it? I thought that that was sort of back to nay or something like that. Potentially, yeah. So I, that's entirely possible. Yeah, I don't want to give too much credit, but okay. I would, I'm anyway, confident yeah. that they were the first to look at this and understand the identifiability right. issue, which becomes much clearer right. For sure. right in this way. But yeah, certainly. Please, uh, if anybody has the correct reference, I, I'd love to. No, no, I'm not the expert. I thought maybe you would. Just... <laughs> okay. Anyway. No, I, I should have done. I should have dug further, maybe. But uh, this is the first place I found it. But I'm sort of new to the area. Cool. Thanks. So at any rate armed with this nice definition it's immediately clear that there might be a problem right because i have in the original generative process i have two parameters right i have two functions lambda and mu um but the likelihood sort of only depends on one thing right so you, you immediately start wondering if it's possible that multiple of these functions can map to the same lambda p and indeed that was their insight is that the answer is yes so it is entirely possible that i have different lambda and mu functions that map to the same pulled rate and that's bad, right? Because, well, the likelihood depends entirely on the pulled rate. So I, if I tell you a pulled rate function, that gives me the likelihood of the tree. So that means that if I have two different parameterizations leading to the same pulled rate, then they're going to generate the exact same tree for any number of leaves. doesn't matter how much data I give you. Distributionally, they're going to have the exact same form. And it's going to be impossible for you to tell which of these two parameterizations generated the data, the data in this case meaning the tree. So this is bad, right? Because at this point, you know, a, a bunch of papers have used this model in order to infer these functions, lambda and mu. I showed you a few slides, uh, some, some, some figures from papers that did it. But there's no way to know whether you estimated the correct lambda and mu if, or if there's some other combination out there that maybe just generated the leads to the same exact distribution of data. Uh, so this was the, this high profile result of theirs, a very nice result that came in nature. And, um, in statistics, this is what we would call unidentifiability. Um, so an identifiable model is one where, so we're gonna introduce a bit of notation here. So I have a parameter space that's just big theta that's completely abstract and I have a likelihood which maps parameters to likelihood functions. So I'm mapping P, uh, or a, a likelihood that's parameterized by little theta which lives inside of these parameter space, right? So this is very general. So the model is just the, the image of all of the parameters, all the possible distributions that you could get, all the possible likelihood functions. And this model is identifiable if basically if this mapping is injective. So in other words, if I give you two distributions are the same, that are the same, they have the same likelihood functions, p theta one and p theta two, that necessarily implies that theta one and theta two are the same. In other words, that the parameters that induce this model are the same. And if that's not true, then you have what's called an unidentifiable model. And that's not good, right? Because in an unidentifiable model, I can give you, you know, I can say I got an estimate, but it's possible that there's some other combination parameters that would give me the exact same data. And so statistically, it's gonna be impossible to figure out which of those two parameters is the one that actually generated your data. So basically estimation is impossible. Um, and Formally, you know, you can't have consistency, right? You cannot have that your, your estimator converges to the truth 
you know, regardless of how much data you get, because you'll never know whether you're converging to say theta one or theta two. It could be many different parameters that generated the same data. So this is fundamentally, it's a mathematical question. There's no randomness involved, right? It's like, if I give you even an infinite amount of data in the tree setting, let's say I gave you an infinitely large, like I let the number of trees go off to infinity. What the unidentifiability result says is even in that extremely favorable case where I perfectly observe the tree and I let I give you as much data as you want, there will never be a method that can accurately distinguish between all the different parameters in this model class. So here's a quick example of a nothing to do with phylogenetics, just a classic example of unidentifiability is when you have like a mixture model. So this is a Gaussian mixture model. I just plotted like the Gaussian PDF. So the mixture is the average of these two PDFs. And so it's this black line here, right? So one PDF maybe is centered at say minus one and one is centered at plus one, the red and the blue. Okay, but the data that are generated are from this mixture distribution, which is in black, this density. Okay, so clearly I can just swap the labels, right? I can make the red, I can make the red distribution live where the blue one is and vice versa, or formally I can just take the means of the two distributions and flip them, right? And these, these produce the exact same model because they have the exact same average density. Right? So this is, a, this is an unidentifiable model class. This is a very classic example. Mixture distributions are unidentifiable up to what's called label switching. So I'll never be able to figure out, nor does it really make sense to try to estimate, you know, like the order of the parameters in this mixture model. Um, so all I can get necessarily is that they're unique up to some permutation. So the theorem of Luke and Pinnell stated formally, uh, I, I'm paraphrasing the result a bit, but it's basically this. It says that I'm going to let my parameter space be that of all uh, continuously differentiable functions, right? So and they need to be positive. So I'm going to, if I'm just trying to, if the only assumption I make about my phylogenetic model is that lambda and mu are just kind of functions with a little bit of smoothness. Um, then this model is unidentifiable, meaning if I give you any lambda and mu that might have generated the data, they can come back and cook up a different alternative set of lambda and mu that would have the exact same distribution. So quickly how the result works, uh, basically this function E that is what was used to define the pulled rate function, it satisfies a certain ODE. We don't need to go into why this is, but if you sort of plug this in to this equation for the pulled rate function, you can you can uncover this identity here, which is that lambda p prime, so the derivative of the pulled rate function is equal to the pulled rate function itself times another product of the difference of it and another function, which is called what they call the pulled rate of speciation. So the, the typical rate of net rate of speciation is lambda minus mu. It has this additional term here, which they call makes it the pulled rate. So the key idea is just that, well, this is, a, this is just a differential equation, right? So if I have any two functions, basically if I start this with the same initial conditions, in, in other words, I find another lambda p star that has the same initial condition at zero and another r p star that has the same condition, then these two models will be a, what's called congruent. So they will give you the same, uh, basically the same likelihood. So in other words, if I can find, if I give you lambda and mu, and if I can find lambda star and mu star such that these conditions hold, well, I just plug these into this ODE and I get that the, that these models have the exact same likelihood. And their key insight is that that's that you can do that. You can uh, basically there's an explicit formula that gives me the the RP star that I would need in order for this to, for this to work. And so in their paper, they've got plenty of examples of you know what are called congruent models, and they show you that you know how this can go wrong pretty quickly, right? So here I've got. Uh, focusing on panels B and C, I copied this from their paper. These models are all congruent, and they all have uh, models one through four have these rates of speciation and extinction, right? So you can see they look very, very different. Right? Some are decreasing, some are increasing, et cetera, et cetera. And from data, there's no way that we could ever distinguish which of these models would have generated any data set of any size. Okay, so what do we do um, with unidentifiable models? So this is a question that un unidentifiability arises in various contexts. People have thought about it elsewhere. So one thing, obvious thing is you can try to estimate the equivalence class, right? Which is 
the set of all models such that they have the same likelihood. So I'm sort of modding out by this congruence. That's sort of one option. So this means that I'm going to sort of with reference to the previous slide, my estimate would be for this particular model, it would encompass all of the models shown here, right? Plus many more, in fact, infinitely more. Um, so that's one thing I think some people are thinking about. I personally am a little skeptical. I mean, if you just look at this slide, I, without some additional hypotheses or assumptions, I'm not so sure how useful that'll be, but uh, maybe it could be made to work. The other option I think, which is more promising is to restrict your model in some way. So restrict the hypothesis space or the set of parameters that you're actually going to care about. Um, and basically find a subset of this space where this mapping is injective. So that, in other words, where this model would be identifiable when we restrict it to this identifiable subspace. And that's the tack we're going to pursue here. So uh, I was earlier sort of uh, when I was in grad school, another student of in my group and my advisor sort of worked on a very similar problem arising in pop gen. So that my background is mostly in pop gen. Um, and what they noticed is that, so the, a similar sort of phenomenon has been known to occur when we're doing inference using what's called the sample frequency spectrum. So the sample frequency spectrum is, is a, a very highly compressed summary statistic that you can form by basically counting up all of the, uh, all of the derived alleles you see in a data set in a particular way. It's not essential for this talk, but the point is that that is also sort of that mapping um, from, in this case, the what's called the demographic history, which is another sort of rate function. Uh, that mapping to the from rate function to, to sample frequency spectrum is also un unidentifiable. Um, and what what Anand and Yun found was that you can sort of restore identifiability if you if you assume that the model actually lives in a nice space. So in this case, they assume that the model is piecewise constant. So this rate function is piecewise constant. And in that case, they were able to prove that that this set of models consisting only of piecewise constant rate functions is indeed identifiable. <clears throat> And basically, knowing this paper it is sort of what first got me interested in this other result once I heard of the Luke and Pinnell paper, because I figured um, it's you know, possible that a similar phenomenon holds. So that was the first thing Brandon and I worked on. Um, we, we assume that our birth and death rate functions are, are piecewise constant with some number of pieces. And in that case, we're able to show basically by using similar techniques, sort of generalizing the techniques in this paper to the phylogenetic setting, we we're able to show that indeed this model is identifiable, um, assuming some condition on the number of tips in the tree, which um, would be satisfied probably in many applications. Okay. Um, so I'm not going to focus strongly on this result because we've got a new result, which is better and also simpler to prove. <laughs> um, but just to kind of the thrust of this result. <clears throat> Is as follows. So these are the these are the functions I showed you from the original Luke and Pennell paper, and here I've just approximated them with piecewise constant functions, right? So I just made a step function approximation to each of these lines. Right? So the ones on the top are not identifiable. They have exactly the same. Like if you match up the red birth and the ref, red death functions, then uh, these these all lead to the exact same mathematically identical pulled rate function. However, the ones on the bottom will be different. Uh, they have to be. Um, and so the question, I guess, at that point is kind of, you know, is, is this a believable class of models for your biological application? You know, is it okay to assume that the rate function is piecewise constant, or do you really need to assume that it's smooth? Okay, so this was a sort of a first step in that direction of getting an identifiability result. Now you, you know, as a if your background is in biology or maybe even not, then you're staring at this and obviously like this function does not look as natural as this one. And so a lot of times we maybe would expect that there's some smoothness when we're dealing with natural processes that are kind of occurring over millions of years. So maybe they're not biologically realistic. And so one thing you might wonder is like, is it the actual presence of these jump discontinuities that makes these functions so weird that they are identifiable? In other words, are there smooth models that are also identifiable, or is it something about the weird nature of these functions? So in the paper, we conjectured that this result probably extends to uh, splines or piecewise constant, uh, sorry, piecewise polynomial functions. And we made a conjecture about that. That was sort of the natural extension of the result that we did have, sort of if you just, uh, just extrapolate what might be going on based on the degree of the polynomial in question, we make a conjecture like this. 
So the conjecture turns out to be true, but we can, uh, it turns out to be, we can say something considerably stronger. So that's what I'll talk about for the rest of the talk. Um, so our new result says, we're going to assume that lambda and mu are piecewise polynomials. Okay. So piecewise polynomials of any order, they can have any number of pieces and they can have any order. So this is a very general large class of functions. It can be very smooth. So if you know a bit about polynomial approximation, I can, for example, I can assume that these are splines of any order. I can assume the most popular choice would be something like a cubic spline. So then they have some continuous derivatives. In fact, they, they're continuously differentiable. Um, so they would, they would be sort of a subset of the model class that Luke and Pinel are looking at. So they can be smooth. Um, but nevertheless, we can show that if these functions are, well, basically that these functions lead to the same pole rate function if and only if they have the exact same polynomial parameterization. Uh, one thing I maybe forgot to mention is there's this third parameter in this model called rho, which is the fraction of sampling that you do at the present. And we have to assume that that's equal among all models. If you don't assume that, then actually it turns out that even just constant models are unidentifiable. So we're sort of fixing this third parameter in a way that um, I, I think is fairly standard, but this is a major caveat of the model. <clears throat> So that's the theorem. Basically, we have this if and only if result that the pulled rate functions are going to be the same, only if you started with the same polynomial rate functions. Okay. So again, this is a pretty big model class, right? It includes like anything you could possibly model with piecewise polynomial functions. Um, and it's a arguably a bi more biologically realistic choice than just piecewise constant. OK, so the proof of this result is actually rather easier than the one that we had first. Uh, it doesn't revolve around coalescent theory or anything like that. It's really just looking at basic properties of polynomials and a bit of analysis. So I'll sketch out the proof uh, in the next few slides. So first we'll consider the case where these are not piecewise polynomials, but just regular polynomials. And that's actually most of the work. Once you have it for piece, for regular polynomials, you'll see that there's a simple argument where you just kind of zoom in to a part of the function, and I'll show you it later. But So we'll assume that these are just plain old polynomials. And we're going to assume that they're going to be non-negative over some interval 0 to tau 0, which is that this origin time that we assume is also known. OK, <clears throat> so the key lemma uh, is as follows. So basically, we're going to define this other auxiliary function p, which plays a key result. Um, basically, if this function is 0, and we also have that the two models in question, the birth rates are in question, in question are the same at time 0, then it's going to imply that these models must be equal. So in other words, I started with these two polynomial models. I'm going to look at this particular polynomial. This has to be a polynomial because all of the functions in question are polynomials. And I'm going to give a sufficient condition where which would imply that these two models are in fact equal. And the condition is basically that this thing is identically zero. Sorry, can you just uh, review, like, so this is a fact about polynomial models or polynomial models that are parameterizing birth death models. And like, are, like, where is the data? How, is this just a simple, not simple, but like, is this just about polynomial functions or is this about birth death models parameterized by polynomial functions? Uh, this is gonna, this is going to be about uh, sorry, this will be about birth death models uh, yeah. that are parameterized in this way. I mean, all it's really all we're releasing here is that this is the rate and this is the pulled rate, or sorry, the net speciation rate. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Okay, so <clears throat> what we're going to do is write this function p. So this p I'm going to break up into three terms, p1, p2, and p3. So each one of the terms p1, p2, and p3 is uh, given to me by what's shown up here in the top right. OK, so p3 is a polynomial that has degree that's at least as high as p1 and p2, right? Because here I have the derivative of lambda 1 times lambda 2 and, and vice versa for p2. Here I have the product of those two functions, not differentiated, and also possibly some other polynomial as well. Okay. <clears throat> 
So if P is equal to zero, then all the higher order terms of this thing have to be high order, meaning all degree that's in excess of the degrees of these two. They also have, this, that, those all have to be zero. So in particular, the leading coefficient of this thing would have to be zero. Right, and since the leading coefficients, we're, since these are positive functions and we're assuming that uh, lambda one and lambda two have non-zero leading coefficients, which is a reasonable assumption, then that would imply that the leading coefficients of R1 and R2 have to be zero. Okay, and then you just make a simple sort of inductive argument and you can show that all, all of basically that these, these two polynomials are identically equal. Okay. So lastly, I'm gonna differentiate the log of this positive function, right? So that's just, um, that's just the ratio of the derivative of lambda one to the derivative of lambda two. And since we know that P3 is now identically equal to zero, then we get that these ratios are equal, which tells me that lambda one and lambda two are equal up to a constant. So this is, this is constant is a number, not a function. These are polynomials, but they're equal up to some constant. And finally, well, I know that if lambda one is zero, at zero, that lambda one zero and lambda two zero are equal at zero, then that means that the constant must be one. Okay. So there's one other technical result, and then I'll put it together and explain why this implies identification. Okay, the second lemma is just uh, sort of a little bit of real analysis, not very much. <clears throat> It says that if u is a limit point of this set, so I'm going to look at the set of all t where the two pulled rate functions are equal. So u is a limit point of this set if basically every neighborhood of u, every open neighborhood of u, contains some point in this set. All right. So if that's true, that I can take a limit approaching u along points in this set, so I can get that uh, by continuity. These are both continuous functions. That zero is equal to the difference between lambda p lambda one u and lambda two u, lambda p one u and lambda p two. And that's actually also true for the derivative of the logs, again, by continuity and the fact that I'm taking limits along points in this set. Okay. So then I just used an expression for the log of the log derivative, the derivative of the log of lambda p. This was actually came up on an earlier slide. Um, and that implies that then I have that the logs of these two things are equal to the derivative of the logs are equal everywhere. So this gives me that P is equal to zero. Okay, so then um, I'm gonna put these two results together and show you that this implies what we're after, which is basically that the pulled rate functions for these two parameterizations have to be different on a set that has positive measure. So that's enough for me to get that's that's enough for me to prove identifiability because if you think back to how this enters in to the likelihood function, this is basically a rate function. So if these two rate functions are different on a set of positive measure, then this implies that the likelihood functions will be different on a set of positive measure. So this is the result we're after: is that these two functions, lambda p one and lambda p two, are different on a set that does not have measure zero. Well, okay, so. By the previous two results, one of two things must be true. So if lambda, if these two models are not equal, in other words, I know that the models are unequal, the polynomials, in, in other words, are unequal, then either, well, it must be that either P1 is not equal to zero because of the, pre, the result from two slides ago. If P1 is not equal to zero, then from the previous result, I know that this has only finitely many limit points. Because if it had infinitely limited points, then this would in fact imply by the previous result that P was equal to zero. So then if I look at the complement of this set, the complement of a set that has finitely limit, many limit points has full measure. So that implies that this set has full measure, which is the conclusion I'm after, that these two functions are different on a nominal set. Well, the other option then could be that lambda one and lambda two are not equal at zero, but that in that case, that's easy because lambda p1 and lambda p2 are continuous functions. And if you think about how they're defined, if these two are not equal at zero, then these two functions are not equal at zero and they're continuous, so they must be different on this on a set of full measure also. So those are sort of the only two cases that are possible based on the, on the lemmas that we just showed. And so this gives us that both of these, these functions must be different on a non-null set, and that's, that's what implies identifiability. 
Okay, so before I was assuming that lambda one and lambda uh, the all of the rate functions were just polynomials, but I said that the result is actually true for piecewise polynomials. Um, and here I think it's easier to just draw a picture. Uh, so with my very bad drawing skills, I'll show you my picture. So here are my two rate functions. Let's say I'm just going to keep mu constant and I'm going to consider lambda one and lambda two, right? So I have the common mu, but lambda one and lambda two might be different, right? So I have these two rate functions and I just need to zoom into the first place. So I know these two rate functions by hypothesis are not equal somewhere. Uh, if they were equal everywhere, then that would, that would not be, that would imply with the previous result that, um, well, I, yeah, I can assume by contradiction that they're not equal everywhere. And then I'm just going to zoom into like the first part where they're not equal. So these could be piecewise polynomials, right? So I could have drawn some spline here that's not a single polynomial. But if I zoom in far enough, if I restrict locally to some part of the polynomial and zoom in so much, I can just get to a space where everything is polynomial, right? And so I know that lambda P1 and lambda P2 up to this point have to be equal, but then by the previous result, I just focus locally on this area where there, these, these functions are all locally, just plain old polynomials, not piecewise polynomials. And I know from the previous result then that lambda P sort of fast forwarded to this particular region must be different. These two lambda P's must be different. So that gives me again, that they're gonna be different, different on a set of full measure. Now that set could be very small, right? I'm, I haven't so said how much I have to zoom in, but it is the case that they will eventually be different on some set that has non-zero measure. And that's all we need to show that these are identifiable. Okay. Yeah, that's cool. It doesn't seem like it requires a whole lot as far as like the junctions between the polynomials or anything you just no. need to have. Yeah, it's you, that's why, yeah, you can have polynomials, you can have any order, any number of pieces, as long as it's finite. You just zoom into the point where they're different, and it must be the case by this previous result that locally they're polynomials, and therefore, you know, things are identified. <clears throat> okay, so let me repeat the picture that I showed earlier, uh, that picture I showed you with piecewise constant. Now we can do splines. I chose splines just because, you know, those are easy to fit. Um, I didn't try very hard to make the nicest possible spline fit. I just kind of approximated these, these functions from Luke and Pennell's paper with um, um, fixed knots, no adaptive not choosing or anything. Um, so you could maybe do better. And so now the question is like, you know, is this a reasonable class of models, the one here on the bottom? Um, or is it the case that you, uh, you know, do you think that these birth and death rate functions really need to be just any smooth C1 function? So if, you're, if you believe that splines are okay, then these would be identifiable. These necessarily have different lambda p's, like these combinations of the red birth and death rate. You can see they're a little bit different, right? So splines like, again, I could have cranked up the order of the spline approximation and made these visually identical. I'm just doing this for illustrative purposes, but in real settings, you would wanna to estimate splines with a probably a fairly low number of knots and probably no higher than cubic. And so you can see there are some visual differences, right? Like this model class on top is in some sense more expressive than this one that I've selected on the bottom. Um, but maybe it's the case that this is all, and also you could potentially, if you're not careful with your splines, you could have things dipping into negativity here, which it could be bad. But in general, you know, maybe it's okay. Maybe this is a reasonable class of models with which to do inference, um, in which case you're sort of back in the identifiable set. So that's the sort of good side of the story, but the bad side of the story is, you know, I, I haven't told you anything about um, wh what's called finite sample results, right? So I've only talked about identifiability and that's, that's an asymptotic result. Everything is happening in an asymptopia where you have infinite data. But of course, in real settings, you don't have infinite data, you have finite data. And so the, the real interesting question is more about kind of like, what can you do with finite amounts of data? And with finite amount of data, you know, you'll, you're going to estimate these these curves with some error. Um, and also, if you look at sort of the thing that I would actually estimate from data, which would be this lambda p function, and then I would sort of back out from that the extinction and speciation rates. So I'm plotting these now. The colors correspond to the spline functions that are shown in the previous slide. And this is lambda p here, and then the pulled net diversification rate. So in particular, this one is like something I could estimate just by using it. A, a typical estimator, even a kernel method actually, I think would work. So in that case, you can see that these these numbers have, these curves, sorry, have to be different. That's the theorem. Like 
if I give you different polynomial parameteriz parameterizations, then these, the resulting lambda p are different. But the question from a finite in a real world sense is like how different actually are they, right? Because you can see if like, let's say the true model was green, um, you can see that this green function looks quite a bit different from these other competitors, right? So maybe it's more feasible to estimate this green function or at least test whether this function is, you know, whether the green function generated the data or one of the others. Whereas if you look at like the red and the orange curves here, they're almost identical, right? So they're not identical because they can't be exactly the same, but they're very close. And this indicates that it, unless you have a huge amount of data, it's probably not going to be possible to very accurately like tell which of lambda, sorry, which of red or orange generated your data, right? But nevertheless, red and orange look very different in this plot. So the identifiability story is only like half the picture. Um, you need to be thinking also about like what's called conditioning, like basically how sensitive is the data that you're seeing to perturbations in the in the parameters. And so the like the choosing between sort of red and orange here is would be like very ill-conditioned in my mind. It'd be very hard to do without a ton of data because you'll in practice you'll observe noisy versions of these, right? You'll get noisy estimates and those estimates will just overlap for the most part. <clears throat> so that leads to sort of the second half of this paper, which is we wanted to think about what's called hardness of estimation. Um, and so this again builds on some earlier work from like coalescent theory literature. And we're just asking a simple question about hypothesis testing. So I, in one hypothesis, I have some pre-specified lambda and, and, um, and net diversification, right? So this is equivalent to working with lambda and mu, it's just easier to work with R for us. So that's my sort of null hypothesis is the data were generated from this model. Um, and in the alternative, I'm gonna assume that the data are generated by just scaling up lambda by some small factor eta. So this is a constant, this is not a function here, this is just a number one plus eta, and everything else is the same. So I'm asking you basically, can you tell me whether the data were generated from H0 or H1? Okay. And I'm gonna do this by generating IID samples from this distribution, right? By basically sampling from this, this uh, rate function distribution. So the question is, what's the probability that I correctly guess which of H0 or H1 generated the data? Um, and so the, the sort of theoretical lower bound for that, the, the number below which you cannot do any better is called the Bayes error rate. So no classifier can beat the Bayes error rate for doing this classification problem. And what we can show, this is building on some earlier work um, um, that did the same thing for, for uh, coalescent models, is that this probability is can be close to a half, right? So no classifier for, would do worse than a half if you had sort of equal a priori uh, probability on H0 and H1, then you can't do worse than a half because if you're doing worse than a half, you could just flip your prediction and do better than a half. So the, the worst you can do is a half. Um, and so what we can show is that in a, as a function of the amount of data you have, which is capital N here, then this, this probability is lower bounded by a number that can be very close to a half, right? Um, so basically what this result is saying is that you need like quadratically much data, one over eta squared in order to have the error rate actually going off to zero asymptotically. So if you think back to what eta represented here, this is sort of the magnitude of the perturbation in the, in the birth rate function. So you need, if eta is a small number, then you're gonna need n to be like very, very large in order to get any sort of possible estimate. If you don't have n doing that, then there's basically there's no hope. Um, this result is information theoretic, which means that it applies to any possible estimator. It doesn't matter. There's no um, dependence on what procedure you use to settle this question. None of them can do better than this by, by statistical theory. So here we should be thinking about it being like a fixed perturbation, not something that's like wiggly through time or something like that. Yeah, no, it's just a fixed number. It's just a real number, yeah. So we're just asking a simple question of, can you tell me, did I perturb, did I multiply the birth rate by a little bit or not? So, and, you know, it's a, this, is a, this is a theoretical result. It's not, it's arguably not that useful in practice, but it gives us some inkling for this ill conditioning that I was talking about. Got it. But if we were to try to, I mean, if you were to try to think about it being a function, uh, like, would it be you, like the max or something like that? Yeah, the, oh, sorry, didn't mean to do that. The, um, yeah, so you're saying, can we generalize this result to where this is a squiggly function? 
Yeah, we'd probably end up just working with like the suit norm of it though. So it would kind of reduce yeah. to something uninteresting. Um, yeah, that, that, the proof of this re relies quite a bit on the on, on manipulating these integrals and ODEs that I showed you earlier. So if you had another thing in there that depended on T, I think it would probably not be that easy to do. Okay, so that's the paper. Um, so just to wrap up, um, sort of the main result is looking at identifiability of these polynomial phylogenetic birth death models, and we can show that they're identifiable under pretty general conditions. Um, but the, of course, the main caveat there are a few. The main sort of take home message is that, you know, identifiability is like the minimal thing you can ask for for statistical estimation. It does not imply that, like, you can necessarily do well on real world problems. and my playing around with this model, I'm sure other people in the audience may have had this experience. You, you can see pretty easily that these models can be very poorly conditioned and you can get very wrong estimates. Um, so this is not necessarily, it certainly doesn't contradict any unidentified. I mean, it's, it shows that identifiability holds, but that's not the end of the story is my message here. So another thing is of course, like our results, we all assume that the tree was known so for the hardness of estimation results, that sort of makes them in some sense like stronger, right? Because even if you know the tree perfectly, you can't do better than this, right? which is already kind of bad. And in practice, the tree is not known with perfectly. It's, the tree is estimated with error. So your errors would propagate into these classification probabilities. And so it could be even worse. On the flip side, the identifiability result is it sort of colors that result, right? Because I, I can show you that the model is identifiable if you give me the perfect tree. But that does not imply, again, that the model is necessarily identifiable if I have to estimate the tree. Um, and Brandon and I sort of thought about this a little bit. And sort of what you need there is you need to be able to accurately identify branch links in a regime where the number of branches, e.g. the number of leaves, is going off to infinity. And it seems like that is very much an open problem in, in the phylogenetic identifiability literature. I, I don't think anyone knows how to, if that's true or not. So an interesting follow-up could be to maybe think about that regime where it, the leaves of the tree are going off to infinity, but I still need some sort of, something that tells me that I can accurately estimate branch lengths, which is basically what, what, the, what is needed for these, uh, to estimate these pulled rate functions. So in that sense, the unidentifiability theorems are stronger, right? Because they say that even if you give me the perfect tree, you still have unidentifiability. So that's, that's sort of one major caveat. And in general, uh, yeah, the overarching message is that the finite sample question of like, how well can you do from estimating these models from data is, is still very much open. And um, I think that kind of mostly what we know now is from simulation and it'd be interesting to just try, try to understand more theoretically about, about that setting. So these, these results I showed you on the previous slide are a very, very, very preliminary step in that direction. Okay, these are the papers if you're interested. I thank the NSF for funding and I'm happy to take questions. Wonderful. Thank you for the very clear uh, and interesting talk. Um, so if people have questions, please post them um, on YouTube. I, um, I, I just wonder if you could sort of bring this to, I, I know this, these are theoretical results, but I mean, can you connect this with the type of inference that people do on birth death models as far as like the model class that you use mm. versus um, like the the inferential tools that people are actually using these days? Yeah, so the one I'm best familiar with is like the implementation in Beast and that's piecewise constant, I believe. That's the only time I've used it is piecewise constant. So piecewise constant is the simplest thing, right? Um, and that's the one I would stick with by default. Um, because yeah, there's, that's, that's the most, in some sense, parsimonious and likely to be the best conditioned. Uh, we have worked a little bit on like trying to understand a model or a piecewise constant model with just two pieces. So sort of the first non-trivial thing besides just a purely constant model. And there it may be possible to be more precise about what you can do in terms of estimation. And so that's something I'm hoping we can, we can push, push forward. Um, the other thing is like just if you're given an estimate, just simulate data under this model and then see if you infer, like see if you can actually recover the thing that you estimated, right? So it's sort of a parametric bootstrap in a way. Um, I've played with this a bit and it can go it can go pretty bad, like, yeah, it, depending on sort of some features of the rate functions. Um, so similar to like, 
yeah, like in coalescent land, you have this phenomenon where like if, the, if there's a bottleneck, right, then nothing really, no information really passes through the bottleneck because if you're looking at a coalescent tree, then like all the, it's all hidden from you, right? Because everything coalesced. And I think similar things are, could be made to happen in this model if you have like very, depending on how you parameterize the birth and death rates. But yeah, in general, my best answer right now is just simulate and be skeptical <laughs> and uh, try to get some, some intuition for how robust your findings are by simulation. Yeah, that's that's great advice. Um, well, um, I don't think I have any other questions. Um, like I say, it was a really clear talk. Uh, are there? Yeah, I mean, are there other things that you're sort of planning on doing in this area after? <clears throat> um, yeah, actually, in the, on the method side more, I'm interested in, um, well, I, I really, yeah, I'm really interested in, uh, so this huge Jassad phylogeny, right, has, is like this amazing resource that has a, a lot of interesting data embedded in it. Um, so the, on, on the method side, I'm interested in sort of, yeah, bigger, sca more scalable methods that can take advantage of all that data. And so we sort of have a first foray into that with this MBE paper I showed you, but I think there's lots more to do. And um, on the theoretical side, yeah, pushing this idea further, I think is hard. Um, so we need kind of a new idea to really get like a like a really clean result about, and in particular about finite sample estimation. So we're still searching around for that. Um, and if anybody out there is interested in thinking about these problems, I'd love to talk to you, but I don't have anything immediately forthcoming. So Peter Ralph asks, uh, the polynomial models approximate general continuous models very well and are yet are identifiable. Is there something general we can say that non-identifiableness of models that are very close to given polynomial models imply ill-posedness of the polynomial? Yeah, right. Definitely. That's that's the right way to think about it, I think. That's, well, yeah, yeah, I, 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 I haven't quite digested this. So, the so basically, Peter, I think... I think his point is just like, you know, any of the unidentifiable models are C1 models, right? So if I, I can cook up a spline approximation that's like epsilon close, right? And that model, the one model would be identifiable and the other would not. Um, but necessarily, it seems like that model, the identifiable one would have to be really ill conditioned, right? So yeah, maybe there's some argument there for the, like, some sort of lower bound again, but about the degree of ill conditioning based on that, based on that kind of approach. That's something we kind of kicked around, but haven't haven't made happen yet. But that's a good idea. Cool. And so it's interesting. So if I understand correctly, the like the polynomial version of the result doesn't depend on the types of arguments, like from Pascal and Song. No, it doesn't. No, it's uh, it's all about it's uh, it's very algebraic. It's just about properties. It's basically, I think, what drives the result is, and we say this in the paper. It's just that the Basically, that polynomials have a finite Taylor expansion, so the sort of the the mechanism that Luca and Pennell use to generate these unidentifiable models it's 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 sort of it's uh, creates a new function that is not will not be a polynomial even if you start it with one. It'll always have an infinite Taylor series. Um, so by what the result basically just leverages that in finite dimensional or yeah with a finite Taylor series you can you can kind of rule out these sort of Incongruence or these congruent model classes. Cool. Right on. I, I just love that you uh, were able to like do both sides of the thing, like <laughs> some some positive results and some like not so positive. Yeah. Results. <laughs> I feel obligated to give some not not so positive because <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, I mean, like it's a it's a real problem, and like that original paper broke some work holes. So, all right. Thanks again, Jonathan. Um, oh, so one more. Uh, one more real quick. Uh, what the Sebastian Prio asks, what additional data would be valuable and ideally available in practice for improving estimates, e.g. samples through time, giving non non ultrametric yep. et etc. Yep. Yeah, so sampling that's right. So the the extending this model to sampling through or this result to sampling through time would be valuable. Uh, another thing we're thinking about is if you have uh, some sort of census type data. So you have like case count data that's sort of somehow also generated off the same tree or a larger tree into which this phylogenetic tree is embedded. Maybe that helps you out. Um, and so that 
that leads to other models that have been thought about kind of recently, um, like at Stadler's group, and I, I think one other also have papers where they're looking at sort of the joint distribution of, uh, of a phylogeny and when you when you also have like case count data that's been sampled off it. So it's possible in that case that you might get better types of rates to the extent we have rates now, <laughs> or, or but yeah, kind of stronger identifiability. All right, thanks again. Bye everyone. Thank you. Bye.